Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We're joined by Bill Crystal this morning. Bill, hey, how are you? Good morning, Charlie. And I'm just amazed that you're yeah, you were out all night, I assume, reveling yeah. in Milwaukee, and you the still made it to this sleep. podcast. So I, I don't know whether you want to you, you want to talk about the Bucks, you know, join in, or whether you just want to sit back and, and let me sort of go off on this. You should go off uh, on it for a while. I'll, I can interject a little. I've, <laughs> you've followed it a lot more closely than I, and it means so much more to you guys in Milwaukee, obviously, than those it of does. us who are kind of used to you know championships and big time games and stuff. But it's an exciting thing for Milwaukee. Uh, well, it's not just an exciting thing for Milwaukee. I mean, this was really a great moment for the NBA, but let's start with Milwaukee. I, it's hard to overstate the level of excitement in this town uh, The to see 65,000 people show up at what we call the Deer District, and there were 17,000 uh, in the in the stadium, and I mean, this town was so just wound for all of this, and and you know it's really not supposed to play out this way. I mean, you have a great team, and it played as a team with a superstar who you want to root for. And think about you know Giannis, is the guy's the he's twenty six years old. He's won you no know, two league MVPs. He won the you no know, series MVP. He's I mean th- this is a guy who is going to be around a long time, and he is so freaking good. And he's it's such sort a, of an amazing human story, right? It I is. Mean, it is. You're yeah. like us, kind of a pro-immigration, pro, yeah. if I can say the word, globalization type, pro-excellence. Uh, everyone comes to America and sort of um, makes a name for himself or herself, but also contributes to the team and to the nation. It's a pretty amazing story, huh? Well, it is. He came. He comes here at 18 and he's kind of scrawny. He's got a lot of raw talent. I mean, he didn't, he didn't, you know, come out of, you know, college as a superstar and immediately become a superstar. I mean, he had a long, you know, long climb and, uh, and, and then, then decided that he was going to stay with, with the Milwaukee Bucks. I mean, he, he could have played the superstar card and gone, you know, with the dream team and he didn't. He decided to stay, uh, he said, say here in, in Milwaukee with this team. And this team won the old fashioned way. I mean, scrapping itself up, uh, you know, enduring some disappointment. So, I mean, he is the GOAT, no question about it, but he's, that's the greatest of all time for people who are wondering what we're talking Um, but uh, it's also, you know, this this organization and this community and this team and, and this guy, Giannis, who is just beloved. Just if I was watching one of the interviews afterwards, very emotionally, he's talking about he's thinking about how uh, how many sacrifices his parents had made to get him this, how much he wanted it, how hard they had worked. And to sort of see it all come together, uh, you know, I you know, you mentioned other, other towns are perhaps used to it. it's been 50 years in Milwaukee. But what a celebration, um, you know, for people who have been writing the obituaries for sports. Well, you know, sports is being killed by this or the NBA is being killed by that. This this was I, I have to I have to say this was great for us, but this was one of the better moments. This this had to be one of the great moments for the NBA, at least in recent years, despite all of the speculation about how horrible it was. We have this small market team. Well, screw those people. Was, yeah, no, I, I think yeah, I want you to say more about that because I, I just tweeted this morning. I haven't followed yeah. the NBA that closely or most sports that closely in recent years. I know a little about uh, Giannis, obviously, because he's so good and such an interesting story. Uh, parents come from Africa to Greece, mm-hmm. of all places, and then from Greece he gets here, and and uh, it does seem like a genuine team effort. But all the stories about sports, it's being ruined by the money, it's being ruined by the owners, it's now all this, this, the, mid- the mid-sized cities can't do anything. The players are selfish, they're yelling for the national anthem, in, you know whether it's the right wing critique of like you know money and individualism and uh, modernity, or the left wing critique of capitalism, and then you see this and you think, you know what, things aren't think things are things will be okay, right? I think you know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I would have been a Bucks fan had you know you know I, I'm probably under any circumstances, but the fact is that you f- this is a team that you really feel good about. Which, and by the way, it's kind of important that this happened in in Wisconsin when we're going through the the Aaron Rodgers um, you know tragedy. <laughs> or, or, also, or wasn't the series really? A, a, and the oh whole playoffs God. were pretty so impressive. Were, were kind of impressive in an old fashioned way, right? I mean, real. Oh, you know, coming from behind, winning on the amazing athletic plays that are going to be. I mean, the block and the lob are going to be played for years and years, and this team is down to o, you know, o and two, and. It's almost kind of a joke here in Milwaukee, you know, bucks and six, bucks and six, and then they freaking do it. 
with the Greek freak. And the Phoenix team is an impressive team as a team too, right? Yeah, they 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 showed up. I mean, obviously, look, you, you don't win the NBA championship by beating the 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 schmucks, right? I mean, you 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 win by by beating the the very best. And I mean, this was this really felt last night like I mean, they willed themselves to win this game. I mean, it was just you could you know you know Gian, Giannis you know was not going to be denied. And, I saw a clip um, this morning of the uh, yeah. the Phoenix coach being very gracious, uh, yeah. not, not a little nice respite from our politics. I think you know, to, and I think he went over to the Bucks locker room and congratulated them, and it was kind of moving actually. Well, I think he under he understood the the level of accomplishment here, um, and I, I just wanted to just sort of emphasize. I mean, you know, all of these other superstars in in recent years, you know, they get the championships because uh, as soon as they can, they go and they they you know they go go to the, the the dream teams right i mean they 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 exercise their free agency and Giannis could have done that and yet he decided to stay loyal to the team that chose him when he's this really this scrawny 18 year old i mean you look at the videos of him uh you know back in you know eight eight seasons ago and uh it is it is remarkable so here you have a guy who just really pulled himself up um, willed himself to do this uh, last night, turned in one of the you know, great performances ever, 50 points, 14 rebounds, but also uh, this, the commitment to, to, do, to doing this and uh, to transform himself and his life. And he, I mean, what, a, what an inspiring story. I mean, he's a guy that just doesn't give up. Okay, so people are going, why are you talking about basketball? I, because you know what? Um, I was, th- this, this town didn't sleep last night. Really, I mean, okay. So uh, do you want do you want to play uh, the just game? Just on sports, yeah. on sports yeah. for a second, more broadly. Pretty amazing year, really. Again, I don't follow this stuff the way I used to, but Tom Brady wins the Super Bowl at age whatever he was, 45, yeah. after going from New England to Tampa. Kind of amazing story. Yeah. Baseball, again, I don't follow it the way I used to, but with DeGrom, uh, our mm-hmm. grandsons, two of them at least are Mets fans, so that's I follow that a little bit. Let's be able to have conversations with them. And they're, of course, they know every single statistic uh, about the Mets mm-hmm. and a lot of others too. But DeGrom's pretty amazing. Tadis, uh, of course, uh, our friend from Japan there who's pitching and you know, leading at home runs and an excellent pitcher. I mean, he's pretty, uh, he maybe a bit of a mini golden age almost. for all Again, for all the talk about it how it's all been like ruined. That, yeah. It's all been yeah. ruined because people don't stay with one team forever and all that sort of stuff. But... If you think of the major sports, pretty impressive. Okay, so we are going to switch to uh, politics. So do you want oh, okay. we, we, we to? I'm trying to stay upbeat here, but that's we, okay. We should. Well, we should do the quiz that I let off with my newsletter. Actually, I let off with the buck stuff in my newsletter I, because I couldn't help it. So, okay, so th- this is testing our knowledge of uh, Mar-a-Lago Agita, which, by the way, uh-huh. is kind of a made-up name. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there were. Um, five. There, there were you know, four or five events yesterday, but but here's three. So, uh, of these three events, which one bothered the apricot emperor the most? Okay, so his old dear, dear, dear friend, one of his closest friends, Thomas uh, Barak, uh, is arrested and indicted on federal charges. That's number one. Number two, having to watch another billionaire show off his much bigger rocket. And, and by the way, I'm just... The visual on that, pretty extraordinary. Or Tom Brady goofing at the White House about the election denialism. Okay, let's, in, in case anybody missed this, this is this is Tom Brady who up until five minutes ago was considered kind of a friend of Donald, right? And and there he is uh, hanging out with, 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 with Joe Biden, and this is what he said. Um, but we found our rhythm. We got on a roll. Not a lot of people, uh, you know, think that we could have won. And... Um, in fact, I think about 40 percent of the people still don't think we won. I understand that. You understand that, Mr. President? I understand that. Yeah. And personally, you know, it's nice for me to be back. <laughs> oh, boy. OK. And that was just joke number one. And just in case, you know, there, there was there was also then number two. We had okay. a game in Chicago where I forgot what down it was. I lost track of one down in 21 years of playing. And they started calling me Sleepy Tom. <laughs> Why would they do that to me? <laughs> so uh, Why would they do, do that? Where would that have come from? <laughs> so this is kind of a trick question, isn't it, Bill? Wh- which, which of those, those things would have bothered Trump the most? 
Brady, don't you think, by far? I mean, oh, no. I mean, look, I mean, Thomas Bar- Bar- by by midday today, it's going to be, I never even knew the guy, right? Right. right. Yes, and, uh, okay, so Jeff Bezos has a much larger <laughs> rocket out there, but I'm married to a supermodel and I was president and everything. But, you know, Jonathan Chait had this great piece that Brady's mockery was the sum of all Trump fears. It's just the worst thing in the world. He wants to be a winner. He wants to pal around celebrities. He wants not to be laughed at. He wants Tom Brady to approve him. And this this is a great, you know, so there you have it. Also, Brady, Brady. um, I thought he was subtle. He did the little joke at 40%. And he said, uh, just a very much passing. So you know what I'm talking about, Mr. President. I thought the Mr. President was, he could have said, Brutal. President Biden, perhaps or something. But Mr. President, there's only one president now. And it's Joe Biden. And Tom Brady's at the White House joking around with him. I think that. That, that digs it in pretty well, to, uh, I think. Uh, this, this, Trump. this is what Chait says. Uh, Biden and Brady, together at the house Trump used to live in and hope to never leave, basking in their winnerness and mm-hmm. laughing at Trump. Donald Trump would rather relive election night a thousand times than see this day. So, uh, so there was at least there was at least that. All right, so let's let's talk about. Um, I, I I saw you in a number of uh, cable appearances talking about the the January sixth committee and the decision by Kevin McCarthy to uh, to name five members, three of whom had voted to overturn the election. Your thoughts, Bill? I mean, I think it was kind of what we would have expected. He he, you know, pandered to the Trump base uh, as as he has been doing and continues to do and the chair the so the ranking members jim banks and and so and jim jordan's on it so he's got plenty of disruptors he felt he didn't want to totally be denounced or or, or be alienated any of the establishment republicans such as they are so mccarthy's gotten pretty good at this and you, i guess you can be good if you're totally shameless and just opportunistic and if the people to whom you're being opportunistic are willing to take little things so little benefits so the establishment gets a couple of more respectable republicans not very prominent ones one of whom actually voted for the actual commission one mm-hmm. of 37 republicans to do so none of them of course voted for impeachment or anything like that so uh un- uninteresting maybe one or two of the uh, better ones, uh, Armstrong or Davis, you know, vote with the Democrats on a few procedural votes or even join a final report or something. That's not inconceivable. That would be nice. But I, I feel, I don't know. I think the commission, the committee could make some difference. I, uh, we've kept thinking things might make a difference and they never do. So I suppose this one probably won't either, but real testimony as to what Trump was doing that day. Um, you know, that could be, I think a reminder to people, some of the involvement of a few of the Republican congressmen like Gosar uh, could be kind of interesting to find out a little more about that. Um, so I don't, I don't know, but uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I see. I, I think they'll try to block. Well, they won't be able to block all of it. I just thought that the Jim Jordan uh, appointment was such a you know middle finger to the whole process. And I, I think that Nancy Pelosi would have been well within her rights to say uh, that, that anyone that voted uh, to overturn the election um, is disqualified from serving on this commission, if, if this committee, if if in fact you you were a an active purveyor of the big lie, then by definition you should not be investigating an act of sedition that grew out of the big lie. Now, obviously, she's not going to do that, uh, so we're going to have Jim Jordan. Uh, but the Jim Jordan versus Liz Cheney matchup. Yeah. Now that is going to be something. Unfortunately, it, it may be a distraction, but I mean, I certainly like. Um, if, if, if I was, if I was drawing up a scorecard for a, you know, a head to head, um, I mean, my money's on Liz Cheney on this one. Yeah. And I think it will be both a distraction and could be interesting and fun and, and, and Liz Cheney could make some real points in the back and forth. Um, but you know, the point you just said in passing correctly, that in a way it should be disqualifying to a voter to overturn the election, but electors in two different States based on nothing, based on nothing. The night after the Capitol is stormed. But of course, that's 60% of House Republicans. So, I mean, in a way, the Speaker can't say, well, those people are disqualified. You're saying the majority of the Republican Party is disqualified. Maybe it should be, incidentally. I think it is in a certain way. From a, It should be disqualified from being considered as a serious governing party for quite a while. But, uh, you know, and if you're going to let there be Republicans on the commission, it would be hard to keep it to the, to the responsible, semi-responsible 40% of the party. I do think I saw a poll the other day. It was kind of interesting that I think some chunk of even Republican and even Trump voters 
aren't happy about the idea of overturning the election. 20%, 25%, depends how you ask the question and stuff. I wonder whether that vote on the evening of January 6th couldn't be more important politically going forward, maybe more important than the actual insurrection. I mean, no one knows the names of most of those Republicans who voted to overturn. They thought it was a free vote, a sop to, the, to their Trump base. I wonder if there, if some of them, most of them are in very deep uh, red districts, but uh, some of them are in somewhat swingish districts. Few of them could have primary challenges, uh, credible ones, at least redistricting. I wonder if that vote couldn't be used against them. You voted to disqualify the electors uh, for president, the voter, the electors for president who were voted on in those states. Uh, you didn't vote to disqualify, of course, the people who won congressional elections in those states, you know, who were sitting next to you. I mean, it's so, it was so gratuitous and unsupported and unsupportable. Uh, I, I wonder if that if that vote on the night of the six could be not as important, but a little more important than we've realized in addition to the actual insurrection on in the daytime of the six. Yeah, th there was also the CBS poll, uh, which I'm sure you've seen, um, asked right. uh, people, how would you describe what happened at the Capitol? 67% um, per of Americans said, uh, you know, it's that's trying to overturn the election. 56% describe it as an insurrection. But then you look at the Trump voters, 55% of Trump voters say that what happened at the Capitol on January 6th could be described as defending freedom which is one of those oof moments. Although, if you want to do the glass half full thing, you go, all right, that's 55%, but that's that that's that, that's not all of them. Um, I mean, and, and as, you, as you point out, you still have 32% of Trump voters who say it was trying to overturn an election, 20% describe it as insurrection. So, I mean, that's a non, not insignificant minority of Trump voters, one out of five, Look at uh, what happened on January 6th and go, that is wrong. No? Yeah, and if you're at a district with, with a member of Congress who voted that way, I do think it, it'd be worth hammering that. I mean, he That member probably can't back away from that too much as he offends his own base, maybe he risks his Trumpy primary challenge. Can't say he, it's funny, almost none of them has said he or she was wrong, right, to have voted that way. So they're not going to say that. But it is worth, I wonder if it's worth, usually, usually, uh, you know, advertising a year before is, is not worth anything. Mm -hmm. But if I were running some dark, buddy, you know, Democratic mm -hmm. group, um, I would put some money up in some of these districts, start to hammer home the fact that, do you realize that you're a representative, you thought he was just a normal tax cutting, you know, Republican, you know, and you voted from kind of without thinking about it. But this guy voted to overturn the election results hours after the Capitol was stormed by these crazy people. And I wonder if you couldn't pry a few percent loose for the general election uh, in 2022 by just getting that, beginning to get that into people's minds. And also that it would put these members of Congress in a little bit of a bind because they'll want to answer and say, oh, no, I wasn't irresponsible. But then how do they have to defend their vote? Or do they apologize for their vote? But that then offends their own voters. So I, I kind of think the Democrats hear us in other cases I have the feeling maybe they're thinking, oh, look, they're, not, they're, they're intelligent people. They must have had this thought that's just as I've had it. And they have plenty of money in these different groups, but they don't seem to be putting much pressure no. on, the, on the Republicans. I feel like if this were reversed, frankly, and it was the old days and you and I were hanging out with Republicans 15 years ago and you had this set of circumstances, there would be a heck of a lot of stuff going on at the grassroots level and in districts and in states, you know, beginning to make this case, laying the predicate for prying some percentage points away from the, the incumbent members of Congress. Well, and also uh, the, the reason why I, I, th I think that's that's possible is, is, the, is the basic reality that we have videotape. And right. every once in a while, I think, well, no, nothing's going to change. You know, it's going to be memory hold. Um, we get more videotape. We have more pictures. We have more images. And Look, uh, there's 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 no case to be made that 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 <laughs> that uh, something on television doesn't move people, and they are so graphic and they keep coming out. I think it's one of the tests of this committee will be whether or not they they are able to you know use those videos, get them you know during the live hearings, live televised hearings, whether they might even start showing up on Fox News. Whether or not there's some moment where even Fox News has to show this. And then in the minds of voters, juxtapose that with people who are going, yeah, this, these these were just tourists. These were right. this was this was this was peaceful. I mean, it's there there comes a reality check 
And I guess I wanted to talk about what's going on with the coronavirus and the vaccines as well. Um, there, there is that moment where you come up against reality and all the buzz and all the spin and all the, 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 the rhetoric comes up against the reality of this is what actually happened. This is the picture. Just like the coronavirus, all of the playing around and the and the you know lib owning about vaccines and everything is coming up against the reality that that kind of irresponsible rhetoric might actually be killing people. Um, so, can we just let me just talk, talk about the vaccines for a moment. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you're seeing kind of you know this this shift, uh, at least among Republican elected officials, it seems like in the last 48 hours, a number of them have you know gotten the the bat signal message. Uh, hey, maybe you ought to stop goofing on uh, on the vaccines. It's it, it's it's time to speak out a little bit more. Yeah, I think they have been a little bit bugged by reality and what's about to happen, which is unfortunately things will get worse. The unvaccinated will get sick. Um, but also, they'll become increasing. There'll be increasing fears, not maybe exaggerated, because parents do fear more for their kids, maybe than they have to sometimes. But about, gee, what, do I want my little kids in preschool or in elementary school uh, when I'm not confident that the teachers or the teachers' aides or the you know the, the support staff are all vaccinated? And people are telling me, and then in my state, people might think to themselves. 40% of the adults aren't vaccinated. So how do, how, 50%, how do I, how do I know if they're, and we can't ask them because somehow that's, as Marjorie Taylor Greene said, not compliant with HIPAA or something. Oh, but no, but seriously, but it's, I think this, the politics of this have changed pretty radically. In the world. And then of course, down the road, as more people who remain unvaccinated, uh, that lets the virus, lets the variants develop further. And people do have the sense that they're more likely, to, uh, correctly, that they're more likely to get it, even if vaccinated, hopefully much milder, but still. And they have more need for boosters. So the whole thing gets much more serious and more uh, oppressive in the sense of as you think of the future. So um, I, I think the people, of this has kind of come home to people in the last week or two. I, my sense, just from talking to people, is that the mood has changed radically. Two, three weeks ago, it was kind huh. of, look, these people should get vaccinated. You can't make them do it. And luckily we're vaccinated. So this right. is me talking to people who are vaccinated, you know, so they won't hurt us. So those are just unfortunate. They'll hurt themselves perhaps, uh, suffer a bit, but, um, we don't wish that on them, but that's just, we can't do anything about it. Now I do think there's much more alarm of the overall uh, effects of having such a high chunk of the population unvaccinated. And I, I, so I think the mood has changed. People are much friendlier, I think, to the notion of requiring uh, organizations requiring vaccination, the federal government perhaps requiring it for certain activities. I think Biden really should have the military uh, all vaccinated. And I know it's an emergency use. So the current regulations don't permit that to be required. You know what? The regulation could be changed by either the president could change it or he can go to Congress to change it. Let the Republicans vote against legislation requiring everyone in the military to be to be vaccinated when they've already got a million other vaccines and they're in the military for God's sake it's not like they're you know not used to being ordered around and to do certain things because I do think it's it hurts the case which I believe in now for much tougher in a sense uh, vaccine pressure incentives disincentives requirements if everyone just looks up and says, well, the military does, isn't even vaccinated. The military is kind of the first in line if you're going to have something like this, right? So um, I, I think the Biden administration should move a little more to the tough love side of the, as opposed to the kindly persuasion to people not to be vaccinated. But I do think the, 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 to be vaccinated. But I think the, the, the move by Fox people and Mitch McConnell stressing it yesterday and stuff is a recognition of this new reality, reality, and also this new political reality. So what do you make of what's going on at Fox? Because we are getting mixed messages. Okay, so you had Sean Hannity, you know, had this sort of limited uh, endorsement of vaccines, you know, um, sandwiched between two anti-vaxxer segments. Uh, but, but um, you know, if you watch from about, you know, 8 to 11 o'clock, uh, you, you would have, you know, um, you know, gotten – you would have gotten the other message, Laura Ingram, um, Tucker Carlson continues to spread doubts and questions about the vaccine. So it, it, it does appear that, that Fox, at least some folks at Fox have figured out that that putting out a message that kills your um, your fan base uh, is perhaps not a good business model. Yeah. And that they need to do something about that. Uh, but but it's, it's so ingrained. I mean, this is part of the problem of the culture wars. You know, when something becomes part of the culture war, there's no fact. There's there's no way to fact check yourself out of it. So I'm, I wonder whether Fox is sort of you know caught that they're that they're you know it's it's why they're straddling like this. 
I mean, what can I, on the one hand, you could say they're caught. On the other hand, you could say they're hoping to the best of all worlds and Tucker's fans could watch Tucker, and, but they can say to their, you know, Rupert, the Murdochs can say at the cocktail parties in New York and our friend Paul Ryan can say, when people say, geez, you know, shouldn't you be doing worse? Director of Fox and Sykes and Crystal, your old buddies yeah. there are saying you're totally irresponsible to be going along with this. Oh no, we see we're working on it. I, I think I think there has been a lot of pressure on Fox and not just by you and me, obviously though, but from lots of people about how irresponsible it's been. But this is the Kevin McCarthy straddle, I guess is the way I would put it. The, mm. um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we all think of it as kind of, it is contemptible and hard to manage, hard to pull off. On the other hand, their lesson, the lesson they take, I suppose, from the last four or five years is precisely that they can pull it off. They can tolerate the worst aspects of Trumpism and even indulge them some, but also keep the kind of rich donors and establishment country club Republican types on board. And that's what they're going to try to do now on, on the, uh, on the vaccines. I think literally that is what is happening. I mean, literally, I think that is probably what Paul Ryan says to people who are going, Paul, and this has really gotten terribly out of hand. I mean, there's a lie about the election. There's the racism. There's the, there's the vaccine denialism. I mean, you're going to do something, right? Well, we have done something. Did you see what Sean Hannity did the other night? Did you hear what Steve Ducey had to say? See, we are doing some of this. So yes, you, you do have, you have it both ways. So you mentioned something else though about, about the, um, the the vaccine uh, push, uh, one of the complaints that you hear is that, well, the vaccine has not been formally approved by the FDA. It's, it's emergency approval, temporary approval. Um, at some point, wouldn't it be incredibly helpful for the FDA to look around and go, okay, we've had one of the largest scale tests imaginable in the history of mankind. It is clearly safe. It clearly works. Why have they not? And I, I'm, not, I'm not asking for political pressure on this. I'm just I'm just asking what more do they need to see to say we are approving this vaccine? Let's let's remove any fig leaves of doubt or excuses uh, that uh, that are out there. Yeah, I don't know enough about, you know, FTA procedures to, to know in detail how much this would be a change and to, to, to accelerate it in this case. I think from a true public health point of view, which is ultimately what we're talking about here, presumably for the FDA right. and the other agencies, from a true point of view of what is better for the public health of the country, I would make a strong argument that accelerating it in this one case, whatever slight hit you take to, oh, you're bending the rules in this instance and all that, would be good for the country. So I think Biden should at least call them in or at least have his HHS secretary talk to the you know FDA director and the others and say, well, you know, can't you do this? It would be good for the country to do this and maybe even insist on them doing it and or just make clear to the country that the emergency use authorization is itself based on a ton of studies and is not something that's kind of tented, you know, is right. not – Emergency use doesn't mean that, oh, we're not sure it works. It just means we haven't got through quite all the uh, bureaucratic uh, hula hoops that we're going to go through later. But we have gone through a heck of a lot. And, of course, you know, a couple hundred billion Americans have taken the vaccine. So I think we'd know if there were some horrible effects. Well, that, exactly. I mean, what what study do you need that would be more reliable than the one we're doing on this massive scale? All right. So – I'm sure that everybody's heard the uh, the, the Rand Paul, um, Dr. Fauci smackdown yesterday. It was still rather a remarkable moment. And this has become another thing among uh, on, on the right wing media, this obsession with beating up on Anthony Fauci, who was five minutes ago, one of the most you know, res- universally respected, uh, uh, you know, doctor scientists in, in, the, in the country. And yet he's now become the symbol. And it is interesting how no matter how respected you once were, Robert Mueller being a pretty good example, once you get fed into this sausage machine, um, you become um, you become this this caricature. But but this was interesting because Fauci clearly showed up at the Senate hearing yesterday. Uh, deciding that he was all out of bleeps to give. Uh, let's let's just play this uh, this back and forth with Senator Rand Paul and uh, and Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci, knowing that it is a crime to lie to Congress, do you wish to retract your statement of May 11th, where you claimed that the NIH never funded gain of function research in Wuhan? Ass- asshole. Senator Paul, I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. This paper that you are referring to was judged by qualified staff up and down the chain as not being gain of function. 
So what was? Saying, let me take, finish. You take an animal virus and you increase its yeah. transmissibility to humans. Right. You're saying that's not gain of function. Yeah, that is correct. And and Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly. And I want to say that officially, you do not know what you are talking about. Let's okay, you get NIH. one person. Let's read from the NIH I, can I of gain of function. This is your definition. Damn. Um, and that wasn't that wasn't the worst of it. Um, here's here's Dr. Fauci um, really pushing back about who is doing the lying. And again, he's he's directing this directly at Rand Paul. Senator Paul, we're look, saying they are gain of function viruses because they were they're animal not. viruses that became more transmissible in human. And you funded it. And, and you, you admit the truth. And you implying. Senator Paul, your time has expired. And I will allow witnesses right. who come before this committee to respond. And, and you are implying that what we did was responsible for the deaths of individual. I totally resent that. Have been. And if anybody and is have lying been. here, Senator, it is you. Huh. So Bill Crystal, uh, you know, you, you mentioned before you, you sense a different mood in the last two weeks about the vaccines. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing a much more feisty Dr. Fauci who's basically decided I'm just not taking this anymore. And I am just not putting up with the kind of bullshit that I'm that, you know, coming out of people like Rand Paul, who just frankly are prepared to lie in public and don't understand what they're doing and are propagating um, toxic nonsense. You mentioned Robert Mueller, and I think that's a very important example, and maybe it was in Fauci's mind. He didn't fight back. He thought the old rules applied. He thought he should behave in a very restrained and dignified manner. And uh, it, it ended up, you know, uh, they discredited, appeared to discredit the report. Bill Barr uh, lied about what was in it, and uh, Mueller testified in a very sort of careful way, and it didn't end up uh, convincing people, even though all the actual material in the report is, is devastating. So uh, maybe Fauci looked at that. Fauci's actually the same generation as Mueller and um, similar in a certain way, career, you might say, you know, and um, decided that I, I just you can't afford to do that. I really hope that spills over, honestly. We need more. I mean, the number of people who still have not spoken out, spoken up about their own experiences, you know, we now know a little bit about what Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, did that because of reporting in different books, but he's still in office, so I suppose he can't really, maybe shouldn't quite speak up. And there are a few of others who shouldn't for national security reasons, whatever. But an awful lot of people have had uh, there are an awful lot of respected people who are just keeping quiet instead of telling the truth about the Trump administration, about the behavior of Republican members of Congress, for that matter, the utter demagoguery, the truth about uh, people on Fox. I, I just think we need a lot more of this Dr. Fauci spirit now among a lot of people, if you want to call them people in the establishment, who have been treating Trump and Trumpism as if it was just a normal part of the political debate instead of an assault on our on the truth and on our democracy. This is the key. The way that you put it is this, that Bob Mueller was playing by the old rules. He thought that the old rules were, you know, constrained what he could do and what he would say, not understanding how fundamentally the world has has shifted here. So, I mean, we would all like to believe that the facts will speak for them tra uh, themselves, that, that, that liars will, you know, self-refute themselves, that the public will see through this, but this is not the case. And so there does need to be this moment where you call out the the dishonest demagogues and you you do that and and I think that Joe Biden needs to do that and I think that uh, others uh, as, as as you point out uh, you know throughout the government need to be more willing to say this and to be to and and, and to not back down um, when they get the kind of vilification because it's coming anyway right I mean it's you're, you know if you're Dr Fauci or you're Bob Mueller um, you're going to be vilified the question is whether or not you push back you fight back and you set the record straight right. Um, and it's incredibly naive to think that the old rules still apply. And it's important for the country to know the truth. Maybe the commission will help with that. It gives people a, a venue where if they call, you know, former Secretary of Defense and former uh, and Bill Barr and people, can they just, I guess they might try to refuse to, to, to speak. But I, I, this does come back in a way to the Paul Ryan situation, which you and I have been very interested mm -hmm. in. He knows a lot about what happened those first two years. None of them has, they all feel like they're supposed to keep quiet, I guess, and Either for their, you know, good of the, they could talk themselves into thinking it's for the good of the country, but how how is it anymore? Really, we need the truth about 
things. Alex Azar, so take Fauci's example. There was an HHS secretary. There was a CDC head. There was an FDA head. All these people under Trump. Maybe they could tell us a little bit more about what happened in the White House and in their dealings uh, with Trump and with Trump appointees, uh, rather than we have to learn learn it in snippets from these books the way we've learned in snippets about what happened at the Defense Department and uh, between November third and, and January sixth. So, I, I really think people need to step up for the sake of not to clear their own names or whatever. They'll do that as they obviously anyway, and they'll try to do that. But for the sake of the country, and, and it's not just Trump, all the people who went along with him, all the people who who supported him during these, this period, all the people who lied on his behalf, uh, they need to be held accountable, I think. Well, I agree. And you, you mentioned these books that are coming out, um, you know, one more extraordinary than the other. And I suppose on one level you go, they're, they're telling us things that we knew, but worse. Um, you know, and, and I am I am struck again and again by as as we see what was going on, how alarming it was to be around him. Why more of those officials have not spoken out, and also how bizarre it is that even knowing everything we now know, that there are people who are all on board with putting him back in the in the Oval Office. I mean, that's that that is the extraordinary thing, the unwillingness to uh, to to move on. By the way, um, speaking of people who are willing to do that, um, it's kind of interesting. Nikki Haley, who's been trying to do, walk the the tightrope, apparently it's not working uh, for her. This is, by the way, is another argument for at least take a stand, you know, and so go down. Um, Donald Trump has made it very, very clear that he's never going to forgive Nikki Haley, no matter how much she sucks up or kisses up. She broke, broke bad on him. She was, uh, you know, mildly critical of him for a few minutes and, and that's enough for her to be cast into outer darkness. So she's been trying to be the weather vane and it's not working out for her, which ought to be a, I think, you know, kind of a, a warning signal to other Republicans. Don't you think? One would hope, but I'd say if the, for the members of Congress, they feel like they're doing okay with their current uh, line, and I suppose the former administration officials uh, wanted some of them are, are you know doing well by being somewhat Trump acquiescent. Uh, others feel they distance themselves enough to be allowed back into respectable society. But I, again, I think a little more pressure for you know a, a full coming clean about what happened would be healthy and not just, you know, for government officials, but sort of in, a, in the culture and in society as a whole. Well, I, I obviously uh, agree. Okay. So I have a confession to make that I have uh, not been uh, following or obsessing about the internal debates and vote counting um, involving the, the, uh, the infrastructure bill, mainly because I'm you know, sitting here in Wisconsin, I have a hard time knowing how much of it is simply kabuki dance, how much of it is just posturing. I mean, these things, you know, have their own rhythm. Um, and, and if you obsess about the ups and downs by the day, it's kind of, you know, a, a waste of a waste of, uh, of, 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 of time. So is your sense right now, will the, and apparently one of these, these test votes is going to fail today. Uh, Chuck Schumer is going to do it and all the Republicans are going to vote against cloture. So it's going to look like it's in trouble. At the end of the day, does this bipartisan bill pass, do you think? You know, I've sort of assumed it might not, but, and everything has to go in reconciliation, but people I know seem to think, yes, they give them a few more days, they'll work it out. On Monday, 10 Republicans show up and do vote uh, for cloture on, you know, this, this bill when it's finally introduced, finalized, introduced. So I guess I just don't know. It seems to be one way or the other, they'll get quite a lot. I think actually the Biden people could get quite a lot through now on. They've done enough to show good faith, I would say, on the bipartisanship that they probably laid the groundwork for holding all their Democrats on reconciliation, which is ultimately kind of what they what they need. But as you say, it's probably better to just wait. There's no point, you know, reading the tea. It's so few senators who are in play and they're being coy and they have their own interests and God knows what, uh, you know, what deals are being cut. So I guess we'll see what, we'll see what Yeah, happens. I mean, it, it's like you, you can pick up some reports saying, okay, this thing is going to be dead. It's really in trouble. It's a life support system. There's going to be that vote today. And then you read other reports right. that they worked late into the night crafting this, that they are really committed to it. And who knows? Um, I, I think probably we'll know by the end of next week, yeah. Um, but I'm, but I'm, so. but, but I'm certainly not going to get into the, you know, deep, uh, you know, deep, deep dives and, uh, and, and hot takes based on, you know, these, these sort of random reports, what this Senator or that Senator didn't say. So Bill Crystal, again, uh, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and indulging so much Milwaukee Bucks talk, but, I, um, I couldn't help myself. So. No, no, quite the contrary. I think it's good for you. Good. Not just good for you, Charlie, for your psychic health, but good for the 
good for the country, really. And I enjoy yourself at the big celebration. Is there going to be one of these giant parades in Milwaukee in the next uh, couple of, of days? Of course. And it's going to be giant. I mean, it is going to be giant. I, I, mean, I was around for the 1982 uh, World Series, which they did not, which the Milwaukee Brewers did not win. Uh, but but after they won the pennant, I mean, th- there was a great deal of excitement and there were parades down, you know, Wisconsin Avenue in downtown Milwaukee. But it's nothing uh, to compare to what's going on right now with uh, with the Milwaukee Bucks. And so we needed this here in Wisconsin. And I think America needed this story. So America needed a new team and it got it. So anyway, thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again. <laughs>